Hey guys, this is Stephen Basher, former Iranian national team player, and you guys are listening to Gol Gazan podcast. Enjoy. Right, welcome back to another episode of Gold Bazan. Uh, straight into the Asian Cup, our first game, 4-1 victory against Palestine. And I'm joined today by Arya and Stephen Betashore. How you doing, boys? Doing well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Good, thanks a lot, Sina. Good to be joined by a good friend of the podcast, Stephen Betashore, who I think we all know quite well now. He's uh, He's been part of the podcast before, and uh, good to have him on. Yeah, my my first episode with you, Stephen. Uh, massive privilege. I've been following you for a long time, as as we were saying before before we started recording. Um, I guess before we jump into the episode, uh, I guess like kicking off the Asian Cup. Um, how have you been? Good, good. Uh, you know, relaxing. Recently, just retired from from football, so uh, it's it's been a lot of family time and uh, enjoying it. Yeah, still here in Denver. How come you made the decision to to retire? I know, like you know, I've watched a lot of player interviews, and there's always like one moment where they 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 feel like, yeah, now's now's time to hang up my boots. Yeah, uh, it started getting time. Uh, I think this past year, uh, you know, when you're not a everyday starter like you have been throughout your career, uh, it's tough. It's tough to go from being game fit to to training fit, and then you get thrown in every once in a while, and then the body just doesn't feel right, and so. Uh, between last year uh, and the year before, it slowly was getting time. And it was just a matter of, um, you know, talking to the coaches and figuring out, do they want me in around in another similar role or do I want to start getting into life after soccer? And so mm. I think, I think the body was just, it was ready of, uh, it was, it was done with the grind yeah. and it's, it takes a toll. So I think uh, mentally and physically I was ready. And I guess, I guess like now you spend a lot of time with family, I guess like it's, yeah, it's, it's nice to maybe have that time with family and like, as I guess like life after football. Yeah. Yeah. People, people don't realize the grind and the sacrifice. Uh, I think everyone watches Saturday nights, you know, under the lights, whether you're at the stadium or watching on the, on the television and they think it's, it's uh, what a life and it's amazing, but they don't see the grind part of it. The, the Monday through Friday working out and sacrificing and all the hard work. And, you know, between nutrition and the, the physical demand you put on your body, it takes a toll. So between the pros and even college of uh, that lifestyle, it was almost 20 years. So mm. I'm looking forward to maybe having some weekends to planning some trips with my family, where normally for 10, 10 and a half months, you can't plan anything on the weekends because you're playing every weekend. You know, you can't call in sick. You just, <laughs> you kind of just have to tough it out and it doesn't matter, you know, no excuses. You got to just keep going and keep playing and be there for your, for your team and, and your club. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hopefully enjoy that part a little bit, but I'll definitely miss the actual soccer itself. That's what yes. they do. Steven, yeah, sorry, Sina. Uh, again, congrats on the retirement and a great career that you've had. Um, but, you know, you, you speak about, you know, having a good time, enjoying yourself, spending time with your family, but are you planning on going back into the game again, maybe in the future from a coaching role or anything else, maybe into working on TV? Is that something you're looking into? Yeah, yeah. I've been talking to a few uh, past teams, past, past GMs, past teammates who are with other clubs. Um, you know, thankfully, I've been in this league for a long time and I've, I've put together a lot of good relationships. So, you know, possibly being an assistant coach, mainly focusing on the defenders um, and, and possibly doing some uh, player development role that uh, I take a lot of pride in uh, for the success of my career, of the longevity. Um, it's something that I think a lot of professionals uh, are missing and could improve on. And so we'll see. I've been talking about different kind of roles um, within diff different clubs. So, um, you know, if something comes up, it might be here, might be 
somewhere else. But uh, I think that's ideally what I would do next. And I guess like talking about this episode is the the Asian Cup, of course, and kicking off with the first game. Um, we were talking before we hit record around your your memories of the Asian Cup. You were very close to actually, you know, going to the the Asian Cup in 2015. Um, I guess like uh, what what happened there? I, I know we talked about before we record, but like yeah, just to give people a bit of insight. Yeah, it was it was after the 2014 World Cup. Um, you know, obviously at the time I was. Uh, in the mix of things with the with the national team and then I got called into the Asian Cup we were just finishing up our season with the Vancouver Whitecaps um, and we were kind of making a run to get one of the final spots in the playoffs I was kind of carrying a little injury um, uh, and and it was on the verge of going and unfortunately I just pushed it a little too hard final game of the season around the 30th minute uh, I pulled my hamstring pretty bad uh, tear and so you know, they, the national team was kind of monitoring when they saw that I wasn't, you know, able to to perform at a high level. They just, you know, they they made the call and said, you know, we're going to bring someone else in for, for the Asian Cup. So it's just, it's part of the business, I understand. And um, uh, unfortunately, that was <laughs> the last time I was called in. Yeah, it's very unlucky. And like, of course, you hear those stories a million times, um, but it's it's just so unlucky because injuries happen to every player. And it just so happens that the injury happened just before the Asian Cup. Like it's just the, the timing is unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I guess like let's let's jump into the episode because Iran four, Palestine one. I guess like very quickly, it might be worth saying how it's it is still an achievement that Palestine managed to put out a team and they didn't they didn't have to pull out this tournament with what's going on in in Palestine. So I know they held a minute silence uh before the game started. So I guess, yeah, hats off to Palestine for fulfilling a team and actually playing fairly well, in my opinion. Um, but just to summarise, there's four goals. Ansari Fahd, uh, Khalid Zadeh, Osman and Qaidi all scored. Um, and I guess uh, let's jump into the lineup. So, um, Stephen, what did you th- what did you make of the lineup before before the, like, the game kicked off? Yeah, you know, I, th- I thought it was a good lineup. Uh, I imagine uh, against Hong Kong, they're going to rotate a little bit so that maybe that's why a couple question marks in there um you know hopefully i know people were talking about a few injuries uh, i think hazada was one of them that picked up an injury um but yeah I thought, I thought it was a good lineup i thought the team played really well uh you know it's it's a team nothing against palestine that you expect team Ali to win um and they they showed that they were the better team and probably one of the favorites in asian cup um and so it was it was a good result uh you you hate to see how the first half ended with the the goal conceded. I think that's more uh, a mental uh, mistake. And then a few chances in the second half. Um, I think the game opened up a little bit too much. Maybe you saw a little bit of selfishness and and people were trying to score and pat their stats a little bit rather than seeing the game out. But again, that's that's up to the coach to to decide afterwards and talk to the guys. Um, I mm. think Carlos Carlos was great at managing that, uh, you know, the egos aside, like this is all about the team and we have the win. Let's just lock it down. Don't give up chances. I, I feel like we gave up a few chances in that second half, but overall four, one good result. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess just, that's, that's the, the whole thing that matters is, is, is the win at the end of the day. It wasn't a full force lineup. Of course, there were a few notable I guess rotations, which isn't a bad thing. It's it's tournament football at the end of the day, and you know we have to save those players for the knockout stages. Um, so I guess like the notable ones in this game starting was was Osman who didn't start the game. Khaidi came in, um, obviously was was outside the national team for for quite a while. Uh, Ramin Rezaian wasn't starting. Uh, Mohammed started instead. So there were a few sort of absent you know rotations, but I I, I thought it was fairly mature lineup. Uh, Arya, what did you make of it? Yeah, you know, definitely some surprise. I think Ansari Fard starting is down to, again, his experience. Um, ordinarily, you, if you look at form, uh, Mogan Lu has been in very good form uh, in the Persian Gulf Pro League. He's top goal scorer there. Asadi, uh, second top goal scorer. If you're looking at goals, those two are, are performing better. But then Ansari Fard is a very experienced player. He's been to multiple World Cups, multiple Asian Cups. And he scored the first in the first minute. So, you know, it shows that he is a, a level above players who are still in form, you know, despite not playing regularly for his club. 
uh, in Cyprus. Um, so, you know, good to see him get on the score sheet uh, so early on in the game, put Iran in the kind of uh, driver's seat to go and win the game comfortably. I think looking at the, the rest of the lineup, uh, I think it kind of picks itself. Gaidi was a surprise. Um, and my camera's gone again. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to sort this out. See now, give me one second. I'm gonna have to sort my camera out. Okay. I'm actually. I'm. A, I don't know him, but uh, Neddy Kaidi, I big fan of his. I thought he was unbelievable yesterday. Yeah, I. I think I've got a bit of a controversial opinion on him. I think he should have been included in previous previous like uh, national team call ups. Uh-huh. I've always I've always rated him. I've always thought he was he was a good player. Yeah. And even if he wasn't really in form in, in his club games, like he's always been performing for the national team. So yeah, I've always been a fan of him. Uh, and and honestly, against Palestine, he was very good, I thought. Yeah. I thought he was one of the most lively, energetic players uh, against Palestine. I, again, I haven't watched him on his club team, so I don't know if this was, uh, you know, a rare moment for him. But what I saw, I was like, man, this guy, I like him. So Yeah, Kholizadeh isn't fully fit otherwise i think he would be taking his place yeah so in the world cup I actually thought um he reminded me of uh Golizade. so i thought he was yeah. just active yeah. uh when he had the ball he's productive um yeah you just you you like that as a defender when you see the other players like a menace just constantly uh wanting the ball getting on the ball and just moving and quick so mm. i yeah both of them i enjoyed both of them well Golizade for me i don't know like I always feel like he should be playing at a higher level because he for for the twenty twenty two World yeah. Cup, I I genuinely thought he was our best player. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's his agents, his agents, his agents have fucked him over. They, they scammed him, in my opinion. Like yeah. the fact that they made him sign a five year contract with Charlevoix was like ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. You should they, not. They, that yeah. should not be allowed to, to happen for a player of his talent. You know. Unfortunately, agents have a lot of power, whether it's for good yeah. or for bad. Um, yeah. You know, I it's it's just unfortunate. You know, some guys you wonder how they got their moves. You're like, this guy's not good at all. And then there's other players who are yeah. unbelievable, and for some reason they just don't make make moves. So agents mm-hmm. agents have a lot of power. It's yeah, it's the dirty sides of football that as I've got older, I've sort of realized that it's 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 very much sort of network. Like yeah. if if certain agents know certain managers, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, or like and vice versa is also true as you, yeah. as you mentioned, yeah. Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's continue. So Cam- we're camera's all, all good. I was yeah, it was just a little bit of a connection issue in the back. I hopefully it doesn't get if it doesn't it doesn't work again, I'll just use my laptop camera, it's not a problem. Um all right. Uh, I was I was gonna I was gonna touch on Gaidi there. So Samsung. Yeah, you're talking about the lineup. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about Gaidi. Um yeah, and then obviously Gaidi on the left hand side, uh surprise uh, selection there, you know, looking at how much he's played over the last year since the World Cup. But again, he made a big impact with a goal, uh looked really uh, energetic, looked really uh, dangerous on the left hand side. I think he was one of the good performers against Palestine. And uh, you know, he gives himself a good chance to go on and start more games in the Asian Cup. So uh good performances from those who weren't weren't necessarily tipped to start, but you know, they did well. Um uh and then, you know, overall the, looking at the, the result, it's a good result for around four one comfortable win. You know, we said on the last podcast we wanted a, a win that, you know, it's a statement. It's a it's a statement that we you know Iran are are ready to to challenge for the the, the title that the, in this Asian Cup. However, looking at the performance itself, I did, I think Stephen's right. We did give away a, a little bit too many chances. Which, if you if you translate that into teams like Japan against South Korea, those chances can turn into goals. Uh, so we have to be uh, more careful. I think defensively, there were definitely issues there that we still haven't resolved. We we keep speaking about it. It might not look that evident, but we haven't faced that many top sides since the World Cup to to say. Iran are defensively secure. I think we'll only really realize how secure we are defensively is when we face a good a good side, and I think we will do that in the quarterfinals against South Korea potentially. So that that's the game that we can really identify Iran as being a good defensive team, because at the moment, from what I've seen since the World Cup and the friendly matches, you look at the, look at the game against Kenya, for instance, a lot of defensive issues there. Look at the game against um, Uzbekistan recently. Again, some really poor defensive showings, individual errors, and team problems there. So, 
there's still problems that need to be uh, addressed. I hope that that isn't uh, a defining factor for for us in the Asian Cup. Yeah, I mean, the caveat is it's the it's the first game of the tournament, and a lot of even top teams are always a bit shaky in the first game of the tournament. Argentina famously obviously lost to Saudi Arabia in the World Cup, and I think Spain back when they won the World Cup, they lost against I think Switzerland when they won their first game. Like top teams are always always seem to be a bit shaky. Even to be fair, like Japan. Uh, conceded a couple goals to to Vietnam and Vietnam notoriously aren't as sort of you know one of the top teams in Asia so there is I guess that's the caveat but from from your point of view Stephen when it comes to analyzing the defense the, the defensive side of of Team Melli given that you're a defender yourself I guess what can you sort of take away what's going wrong because Arya is right there are holes Palestine obviously didn't challenge that much however they did score a goal um, there were holes in the defense so I guess, what do you sort of analyze from that? Yeah, you know, it's it's tough to say that there's holes necessarily just in the defense. I think once the score opens up like that, the the whole game opens up. So it becomes more of a transition game. Um, and then it's about the back line closing up that space so that it, it's not as open. Um, and, you know, whether that's first game fatigue, whether that is players taking unnecessary risks because of the score line. Maybe some guys are trying to pad their own stats. And uh, there's a term that we use is offensive marking. So when you have the ball, when you're in possession as defenders, you have to be in a position to help the support, but also be in a position to defend immediately the transition to defending. So right now you're in attack. Now you have to transition to defend. I don't think that part was sharp. I think that part, we left ourselves a little bit exposed and, you know, against a better team on another day, they can punish punish us. And then all of a sudden it's 4-2, 4-3. Now guys get a little bit nervous, start to panic, a little anxious, and then you have maybe a different result. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to look at 4-1, everyone's going to be happy, yes. But when you watch it uh, closely, I think there's some things to speak about, maybe fine-tune, um, and remind them, this is a tournament. In tournaments, you have to adjust your playing style just a little bit because of the fact that, you know, once you get past this round, one and done, you could be out. So, you know, every game in the group stages, you know, Hong Kong's a, another one where we should win, where we can just work on fine-tuning these little details. I think if you look at the way we're currently playing on the garden, I think one thing I will say with Karen Noe that I think it's good to point out, because, you know, we look at when we had Skocic uh, in, the, in the qualification for the World Cup, his issue was really getting an identity for this team it was we, we didn't play a certain style of football a certain brand that you could you could say this is how Iran play under Kiros we did have that you know we, def we definitely had it. I think in the World Cup uh, this time around I don't think he got it right but he did try to implement a style of play that you could uh, make it that this is Iran's style of play I think Gary Noe is starting to try and do that. You can definitely see that we are trying to become a team where we, we utilize the wide areas very effectively. We get the ball into dangerous positions early uh, and try to punish them uh, either on the either with like our quick players, like our, our fullbacks getting forward, our, our strikers combining early and scoring, uh, you know, goals in 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 the box. But ultimately there's still an area as, as Steven's saying is as much as we're attacking well the team still has to do the other side of the game well which is transitioning and also defending uh, just 1v1 you know at fullback we're not necessarily I think safe like Hyde Saf, he got beaten very easily quite a few times in that second half you know yes you know Again, it could be said that we're winning the game. It doesn't really matter. But the reality is, again, there are so many games in this competition that to still to play that if these aren't addressed early, then we will uh, find ourselves in tough situations. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that whatever has happened in this game is, is quickly addressed. You know, it's not left until South Korea in the quarterfinals. It's addressed next game against Hong Kong and we see a better performance. Uh, this time yeah, and I guess like the fullback seems to be defensively seems to be a, a vulnerability. I mean, going back to the England game in the World Cup, Bukayo Saka and like the the fast England wingers, England notoriously is fairly good on the wings. Um, that's when I feel like we got very well sort of found out. Now, I don't think it's really going to be an issue until we get out the group stage. But then when say you have a Hume Min Son who's 
on fire at the moment in the Premier League, like that's when it becomes a real issue. So I guess like Stephen, from your point of view, when it comes to the fullback position, who who solves this before we get to the knockout stage? Is it the manager? Is it the individual players? Is it the captain? Is that is it the centre backs? Like who who's who's the one that's sort of calling the shots here? Yeah, it's it's more so the coaches because it's it's not necessarily a one v one game. You know, there's eleven players, and so it's more about the team defending, uh, limiting that space, limiting that time that that player has to turn and dribble at you. So if you can get touch tight and not even allow them to turn. Perfect. If you know that your center back has your cover, you can afford to be a little bit tighter. But if you know that your center back's not sliding, shifting all the way over and covering you, and you worry about the ball over the top, well, you're going to back off a little bit because that's the, the last thing you want to give is a, a ball in behind or a breakaway, something like that. So uh, as a defender, as an outside back, there's a lot of things that you have to to judge and uh, during the game, before the game, analyze. And you know, as a team, if you know that you have a very good holding midfielder that's going to essentially just go side by side always protecting your back line you have a little bit more confidence that 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 ball uh, on the ground isn't going to be an issue so uh, all these little things and that again goes back to the coach you know what is he making their players comfortable with and uh, how do they feel as a team not not per se just the 1v1 mm. and do you see that getting fixed i guess before i know we keep saying south korea that's the most likely scenario in there <laughs> And we, I mean, obviously, it's still not done, but that's yeah. the most likely scenario that's going to happen in the knockout stage. So um, I guess, do you see that being resolved before then? Or do you feel like, no? Yeah, well, it, it depends if it's something that they go over, right? Um, you know, I know Karish was more of a defensive-minded, lock it down, don't overexpose ourselves. Um, and so, you know, Coach Amir might have a different philosophy. Let's attack, let's, let's uh, spread out the field a little bit more which will leave you a little vulnerable to the counterattack and in, in those, you know, those chances that we gave up against Palestine. So, you know, we'll, we'll see when you do play better opposition, you might not have the ball as much. So you won't have as many opportunities to, to spread out and leave yourself vulnerable. But um, I, I think it's the mindset of let's be connected. Let's be a, one unit. When we attack, we all attack together as one one giant group. And then when we defend, we all go back and defend together. And there aren't a lot of, uh, you know, entryways or spaces for the other other team to pass through. So, uh, again, that's up to the coach. That's that's uh, not necessarily the players that are going to say this or that. If the coach wants them to play a certain style and they might give up chances, that's that's what he will, wants to do. And that's what they'll live with. I think it's a good mm -hmm. point. I think, I think it's a good point. But I do think... That that the, the reality is there are individuals that do provide a certain quality that maybe another player won't. So, you know, like for, for instance, I think Moharami was unbelievable against Palace. I think he had a great performance. I thought he linked up with the midfield very well, defended very well. Uh, I thought him and really helped that right-hand side of our defense function as a, as a unit. But individually, I thought he, he, he provided great cover for his, for his defenders, he got forward very well, uh, showed some really, really uh, clever pieces of play. Uh, and I think, I think, now I don't know if you agree with me, with me, Stephen, I think, the, I think the, if you really want to play a, a solid defence in this national team, for me, Moharami is a good player and I think he should be playing. And I don't see why that should mean that Roman Rezoyan should also get benched. And, if it was up to me, I would play them both on the pitch. I would have Ramin or 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 me, uh, left. me at left back, Ramin at right back. I think you get the best of both worlds that balls that way. I don't think we have a a solid left back in this team. I don't think Milad Mohamedi has shown enough over the last couple of years to make him a a starter. We saw it against England. You know, he was given a responsibility by Kairos to play as a a wing back. And I think he damaged our, our left hand side as a again in a team scenario. He wasn't he was very dysfunctional in that in that setup. And I don't I still don't see him helping the defense, whether whether even when it's as you mentioned, where the defender drops off, he goes and presses or whatever it may be. I still don't think he, he has the tactical know how to do such a thing. It, again again in big games. So I believe the other the only option we have now. Is to play our two best fullbacks, being that they're both right-footed, it makes it an issue. But it's it's never it's not like that's never happened. I think I think, I think Stephen, you've played left back before yourself in, in your career. 
What what do you make of that? Do you think that's a good idea to maybe push one of them to the left hand side? Yeah, you could do it. I think defensively, it's easier to to transition as a right footed player than uh, attacking wise. If you're attacking, obviously you're more comfortable whipping a ball in, serving a ball on the ground to to the strikers with your dominant foot. Um, so I don't know how comfortable Ramin is with his left foot, but you know I think his right foot is pretty good and he prefers to be on the right side. But it's a tough one. You know, you're talking about Esson, who's your captain, to take mm-hmm. him off. How does That's that work great. with the team morale? Sure. Um, you know, I don't. I, I agree with you. I don't think he had the best game last game, but I don't think he was poor per se. There was that. I was trying to think if it's the first half or second half where he it was on the sideline and he tried to kind of bump it out and the guy flicked it over his head um, mm, and they got a decent chance. From it. Was the second half? Yeah. So, you know, I think there was moments where he just looked a little bit sluggish, but, you know, that's one game, you know. Uh, he's a good player. He's had a, a pretty good career. And uh, I think if the coach just speaks to him and tells him he expects a little bit more from him, being the captain, being a veteran on the team, I think they can expect that next game. Yeah, I mean, look, he's he's playing very well in Greece. Um, he's doing he's done very well for that for AEK over the last couple of seasons. So I do think he still has a place in this team, no doubt about it. Um, but I think we 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 need to speak about the, the main man, Cena, in the, in this. Yeah, game. I was I literally I literally have his stats on my phone because I was going to say them. I think we're talking about the same person. Um, yeah, just quickly wanted to highlight Sam Gordos because he was. I I want to I want to put this on record and say. If we do progress and if we do win this tournament, it's because he he is the heartbeat of this team. I I really don't see us progressing without him sort of dragging the team there because I I feel like he is the the the, the top performer. If you if you look at the stats from the Palestine game, you know two assists, ninety two percent pass accuracy, four four out of four accurate long balls, and then obviously the man of the match uh, award as well. I I really don't and, and and now he's got a manager that actually trusts him. I feel like Carlos Guerrero, we talk a lot about him, talk a lot about the positives. I feel like the one aspect that he maybe, I don't know, it's just managerial decision. He didn't trust someone that much. That annoyed he trusts him. And I think he really responds to that. Uh, he's been playing fairly well for Brentford as well, even though he's playing on the, the left back position. He's actually a contender for playing on the left back position. Um, but I guess, I guess, yeah. Just wanted to highlight him because he's been outstanding, I think. Yeah, I mean, w- with someone, he has really, you know, turned into a, a player that we always knew he was, but we didn't really get a chance to see it. You know, we mean you were in Austria last year, so, you know, when he played against Uruguay, you know, he had a, a, a fantastic game and we were all expecting him to be one of the key players of the World Cup and that chance just didn't come. It didn't happen for him. Um, if it was the wrong if it was a mistake by Kairos, it probably was, but it is what it is. It it didn't happen for him. And uh, but the good thing about someone is he didn't let that get to his head. He he kept fighting through the adversity that he was facing, even at his club. Uh, yes, his contract expired. Uh, they let him go, but he they came back in again at Brentford. You can see how he's how he's performing now. He's playing week in week out. Uh, for in the Premier League. And he's performing very well, and now he's he's one of the key players for Team Melli, and I think he has really shown that in the last few games, whether whether it's friendly matches or this game against Palestine, the first game with the Asian Cup, he's he's been fantastic, and I think he is now what Dejaga was in the twenty twenty uh what well, nineteen Asian Cup. If you remember, Dejaga was was also not really playing so much at club level at the time. But he was still, you could see, a level above everybody else in the team just because of the the class and the quality that he has. And he performed so well in the Asian Cup in 2019. And now I think someone's kind of doing the same thing and uh, really performing well in the midfield in a different role for him. He's playing a little bit deeper as well. So, uh, you know, a great performance. There was a a moment in that game where he he pressed a player from like a 20-yard sprint, you know, (laughs) unbelievable you know really really good um energy levels he's looking a a lot fitter than he, than he than I've, ever, I've ever seen someone look at 30 years old he looks like he's he's at top of his fitness just now uh it's really good uh really good from him and i hopefully it continues uh throughout the asian cup uh steven i've got a question for you about uh, someone obviously you and him are almost in the same boat you know you're both born uh abroad uh, outside of iran you came into the national team a little bit later in your careers. 
you know, seeing him do so well now, how does that make you feel as a as an as a as a legionnaire that you know like you say in, in Farsi? How does that make you feel seeing someone perform so well? Yeah, I'm happy for him. Obviously, I think he's deserved it. Uh, yeah, kind of similar situation, you know, not born in Iran and uh, obviously has a lot of pride and passion for the the country and the people. And obviously, it's his family, right? That's when you when you talk about him, that's the first thing that comes out. So uh, I'm happy for him. I think he deserves it. Uh, for whatever reasons, he hadn't played much before, but you could tell that he's a talented player and uh, he deserved it. And he just kept going. He He didn't sulk he didn't complain he just he just put his head down got to work and that's as footballers that's all we can do sometimes you know and uh if a call comes it comes and you're happy uh if it doesn't you're probably disappointed but some things are out of your control and i think our situations were similar where uh, it was out of our control and so uh, i'm happy for him and i'm glad he's doing well because he, he is a very good player what do you make of his defensive contributions to this team? Because he is playing a different role than he ever used to. He used to be a number 10, he used to be a striker back in the day when he was in Sweden. Uh, you know, he's played out wide. Now he's playing as a fullback for Brentford. Um, what do you make of his defensive contributions, both to the team and individually? Yeah, I think we all know how good he is offensively. Very technical and uh, just a good player. Uh, someone you can rely on give him the ball with pressure, no problem, and can make things happen. I, I honestly was a little surprised. Uh, his his work rate and how his instincts, you know, a lot of times, you know, defensive players just have that instinct. And I didn't think as an attacker he would he would have that. And he just, he saw some dangerous moments and he just put out the fire. And uh, I thought he did a very good job, uh, a little bit deeper in that midfield than what we're used to. A lot of people don't know that someone actually did play that role earlier in his career, like really, really early on in Sweden when he was playing the lower, the lower leagues. He used to be a, a defensive midfielder before he kind of tra- transitioned into a more of an attack-minded player. So it, it might be that he still, he still kind of kept a lot of those natural skills that he maybe had earlier on in his career, and now it's flourishing into a kind of a complete player. You can see how complete he is as a footballer, and I think... I think his partnership with Saeed in the midfield gives us so many more options. As Saeed is more of a, he's more of a, a, he's not static, but he doesn't get around the pitch that as much as as someone has, you know, against Palestine. So I think it's a great little partnership there. They can bounce off each other. It gives us so much more solidity in the in the midfield. Uh, it would have been good to have had more options off the bench. You know, if someone gets injured, for instance, I don't think we have an, a, a direct replacement for him. Uh, but it's a good, it's a it's a very good partnership that hopefully continues uh, in the Asian Cup. Yeah, you see those little, you see those sorts of part- partnerships a lot, and they work when they work. They work so well when you have one very defensively minded midfielder that literally plays so well and and sort of you know commands that space so well, so that the his his other sort of midfielder can 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 be that free role and. I think like the 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 best example I can give is is Paul Pogba and N'Golo Kante for France when they won the World Cup. That was exactly what they did, and they did it so well. Um, and I but feel it, like we're seeing a similar thing with it with them. Yeah, but it's the pressing. It's 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 the intensity of pressing that someone is getting getting into his game. Now it's very interesting to see how much and how 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 effective he is with it. I think it was one instance in the first half, and uh, there was no way he was going to win the ball off off the. Um, a Palestinian attacker, but he was able to get it in a very effective manner, and then and also set us off the counter attack again. So it's his um, it's his as as Stephen's saying, you know, his instincts are are there, but it's also his work his work ethic is is improved so much, and that is it is doubt the fact he's playing regularly now in the Premier League. Mm. I don't know if you've seen this, but I feel like his aggression levels have also gone up, which I I kind of like to see because I feel like he's. He really wants it more. He's got that desire, and if, if, even for Brentford, you, you've seen him sort of. I mean, he you've seen him get involved in fights and things like that. So I don't know. Yeah. Like, he seems like he really wants it. I would say, I would say, someone. He was always a player who was good on the ball, but he wasn't the kind of player who would always want to get on the ball as much as he would as he as he does now. I think he was a player who would get on the ball in the right moments, but now he seems like a player who is always wanting to get on the ball, always asking for the ball, always wanting to get in spaces where he can make something happen, which is something different and a new element to his game that he never really seen before from someone. He was more of a guy who he got in gaps, he tried to get on the ball, give it away early. But now he's he's really trying to dictate play. 
Um, and it's it's good to see him because he can do that. He can definitely do that. And I think he will um it will only it will only make his career longer, I think, if he keeps mm. playing this way. Yeah. And again, not to mention set pieces as well. Um obviously one of his assisted one of his assists came from a set piece. So I think that will that will uh, treat us well going forward in this tournament, given that a lot of tournament goals end up being set pieces. Um so yeah, I guess like that's that's everything on the Palestine game. I guess looking forward now. We're playing Hong Kong um, next week, isn't it, Aria? Uh, yeah, this week. we play them on Friday. Um, obviously, that's the same group game, and obviously followed that by uh, we play. I think it's UAE on Tuesday, uh, the following week. Uh, the only thing I was going to speak about are the goals uh, that we've not, not not had a chance to speak about with with regards to the goals that we scored. Um, the goal that that I think that Jahan Bash assisted for Kaidi. Uh, I don't know what you think about it, Stephen. It's the, the commentators were, were really keen on saying it's how how easy we were able to combine passes. What do you think about that, Stephen? Especially in the final third, our our one touch play. Did you think that that was something that looked impressive, or was it more to the to the fact that we were playing as a a, a Palestinian defense that weren't able to maybe defend as well? But or do you think that's just because? Yeah, of the players I think that was. I think that was a wonderful goal. First of all, um, the way Ali Reza comes inside, I think it opens up a lot of options. And then I think it was uh, Medi that runs through that attracts two defenders, and then it just uh, it leaves that space open for Gaidi. And the thing I loved about Ali Reza's pass was it wasn't to Gaidi's feet; it was to the space so that he can go on to hit it first time. And if you notice, it's a small detail, but the weight of the pass, you know, it's so soft on the ground in front of him into his stride. Uh, a lot of players will just jam uh, a winger up and they put it into their feet. And now they have to take a touch. It slows the speed of the play down. And now the, the defense can get set again. The weight of the pass and the, the angle of it, for me, it was perfect. It said, hit it first time all over it. Like, well, if I'm a winger and I'm looking at the ball and he doesn't have to blast it, he does because it was so perfect. He just guides it and there's nothing a goalkeeper can do there. It was, it was yeah. beautiful. That, that, that play really was beautiful. I think Jahan Bash got some criticism in this game for maybe, I think he, what, what we see from Jahan Bash quite regularly is not that he's not performing well. It's, it's the fact that he, he almost is a little bit overconfident with how, how easily he can get passes through the defenders. We know Jahan Bash is a fantastic footballer. He's got such much such quality. There are times where you think, you know, maybe he, his decision was was wrong there. Maybe he, he could have passed it rather than shooting, or maybe his pass was was a little bit too hard. But that moment, as as Stephen's saying, the pass was perfect because it, it almost made up for having. He, he, like, God, he didn't didn't need to have a first touch there. He heard it first time, it'll go in. Doesn't matter whether it's on, on his left foot, on his right foot. Uh, the pass was perfect. So I think that was a good moment for Jalen Bash. And I think um it showed his quality there. Um and also the 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 the, the third the last goal for that Sardor score, I want to speak about that as well, where someone that can reverse pass to Moharami but when he put the cross in. Um again, fantastic play that the the intelligence to just slow down play and just get release the ball at the right time i thought was was fantastic it, it just looked like he was playing at his own speed essentially in that moment i thought it was it was beautiful to see um so yeah, that's why that's why i'm saying he's, he's the hobby of the team um yeah literally dictating this the, the speed but yeah i i stand by what i said i feel like if we do progress in this tournament far enough like he he is the one that's sort of driving that Okay, uh, this is fan question, Sina. We're looking to go on. Yeah, I guess, I guess maybe quickly, let's talk about Hong Kong just for like a yeah. couple minutes. So, okay. um, I guess, Stephen, from your side, going into Hong Kong game, I, I think like Hong Kong, they did they did challenge the UAE. Um, so, I don't think it would be as easy of a game as we might think. So, like, do you see any sort of changes in the lineup? Do you want to, I guess, like any sort of comments on, on the Hong Kong game coming up? Yeah, I think it's a game that we're expecting to win again. Uh, I think they played not too long ago. Um, and so it's someone that we're familiar with. But it'll be interesting between injuries. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Osmond, I, I don't know if he starts. I know he got to the team late because he was with Roma. And 
uh, maybe he starts, but then for who, um, you know, anytime your team puts up four, it's tough to take out your attackers. Uh, so this might be a mix. Maybe, uh, you know, Amir wants to see Sadar come off the bench and uh, give a, a, a fresh look in the second half or in the 60th minute or later. But, uh, you know, it, it'll be interesting to to how much they switch things up. You know, it, it is yeah. Friday, so somewhat of a quick turnaround. And then you go again on Tuesday. So personally, uh, I would rotate it a little bit so that you have fresh legs going into that third run. Or keep it the same and then that third game rotate, knowing that your your next match you're expecting to qualify for the next round is going to be quick. So you definitely have to rotate anytime you're in. Uh, tournament style like this. yeah i mean from from my point of view like the the uae game is going to be more challenging than the hong kong game i i you know respect to both but i think that's that's sort of the 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 idea and i feel like now given that the tuesday games coming up is very fast turnaround now's mm-hmm. the time to i guess rotate players which isn't a bad thing in terms of both resting as well as i guess seeing how these players perform because you will have to rotate eventually going forward like players are going to get injured tired fatigued um, they're going to have to play eventually. So I feel like now's the time to bring out these players to, you know, get their first few minutes in, in the tournament. Yeah. I think, um, obviously, we just played Hong Kong in, in the qualification. So I think, you know, we should have a grasp of that game. I think we should we need to understand that that game is is a game that Iran should easily win, no doubt about it. Uh, when it comes to UAE, uh, hopefully by then we've already qualified, as Stephen said, and, you know, we don't have to go 100 miles an hour, or we can focus on the second round game. Um, but we still need to, again, we still need to get still need to get results because Iran need to show that they are a team that is ready to go on and, 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 and win this competition. That's what, that's what they want to do, you know, because Japan will go on and win all their games. South Korea will go on and win all their games. Iran needs to be on par with these teams, even though, it won't actually matter when you look at the and in, in, you know when we get to this, when you get to knockout stage it won't actually matter. We still need to show that because it's it's important. I think a team like Iran should be beating Hong Kong and UAE fairly easily when it, when you look at the team that we've got. Again, we look at the goals that we scored against Palestine. We should be comfortably getting two results in these games. And I think you know we've had a couple of injuries. Uh, Khaled's already got injured, um, so Majid will probably step in uh, in that side of things. Uh, again, other changes. Maybe Ramin comes in for for Moharami. You know, could be another another change there at right back. Um, I don't think we're gonna change much in midfield. Maybe Qaidi, maybe comes off. You got Torabi, you got Mohebi who didn't perform so well. As I got a lot of criticism after that game against Palestine. But we have other options out wide as well. Qaidi Zadeh is also available now. So there is there is changes there for Kalenui to make. Um, but uh, I'm expecting a, a a victory and a comfortable one at that against Hong Kong uh, on on Friday. Mm. Cool. So yeah, let's go forward with fan questions. Yeah. Okay. Fan questions. Uh, we have one here from uh, at Omid Eskandarizade. He asks, "What do you think about the conceded goal? Uh, the goal that we conceded uh, just I'll, before I'll half Steven, time." I'll let Stephen ask um, that. Uh, answer that one. Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, it was just. A lack of focus, that's all. You know, it's in the dying seconds of injury time before halftime. Uh, you know, I think Esan falls asleep just a little bit. Uh, anytime that ball goes, if you're on the near side of the ball, on the left side, when the ball goes over, your first instinct as a defender is to, to come in, make sure your ball side, goal side. And, you know, he, he fell asleep a little bit, was trying to recover and wasn't able to get a good jump on the ball. And uh, unfortunately, his man beat him to, to the ball. Um, you know, also, if you want to talk about first phase defending, that header needs to go up and wide. You know, you can't have that ball deflect towards yeah. your own goal. I don't so. think we were aggressive enough uh, to defend that first ball. And I think we need to be a little bit more aggressive getting that ball into a, a safe zone. Um, yeah. And then I think because it didn't happen, I think the players switched off very early and then they got, uh, yeah. made it easy for them to score the goal. Uh, again, Again, things we need to that things again that can be resolved because it's a set piece. Set pieces can yeah. be worked on in training. It's not hard to work on set pieces 
to 15, 20 minutes in, in a training session, you work on a set piece and it can be worked on. I, I'm glad we can see the goal from a set piece than we can see a goal from a, a build-up play situation or something that, you know, you don't want to see your team breaking down defensively against Palestine. From a set piece, it's a set piece. You know, lo- lesser ranked teams tend to score goals from set pieces more than they do from build-up play, for instance. So I'm glad that was the case if, if we're going to concede a goal. Mm. Uh, next when you when you when you say falling asleep and I guess switching off, it just reminds me of like the game against Japan um, in the last Asian Cup when they just like <laughs> they thought the ref blow, blew the whistle, but they but he didn't. Um, it just reminds me of that. So hopefully that doesn't happen again going forward. Yeah, yeah, it, it 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 unfortunately it happens more often than not. Um, end of the half, guys are obviously fatigued, comfortable lead. Uh, it it happens, but you know against. Other opponents, better opponents, maybe where the score isn't as drastic as it was, those moments will hurt you and potentially knock you out. So you need to nip it in the butt right away and just uh, don't do that again the rest of the tournament. Next question comes from Instagram. uh, Darius Darius N dot underscore asks, is a central midfield of two enough to handle... Uh, stronger midfield such as Japan and South Korea. That's a good question. Um, well, I, I I guess like if we if like we would still have you know helping players, so it's not like just those two players will control the entire midfield. You know, you yeah. have wingers coming in, you have the fullbacks maybe coming in and supporting as well. So yeah, you know, it it just depends like who we want to nullify within the Japanese midfield. Yeah. Um, and Japan think... do have a ton of talent. I mean, but we're not going to face Japan maybe until what the semi final or the final potentially. Mm. I think with the four four two formation, I think it's a very it's a bit of a misconception. People thinking that we've got two wide players and two midfielders in the middle. In a four four two, generally speaking, the wide players are not wingers. They are midfielders. They're still part of that midfield. They still have to come inside and defend. They still have to make it a little bit more of a midfield it is four across midfield it's not necessarily two wide and two in the middle it is it is a joint a joint effort so in that sense i'm not too worried when it comes to us building up going forward i think the only time that we that, that might be an issue is when we are outnumbered in in, in certain scenarios if, if a team plays three in midfield uh, in the center and they maybe have full backs going forward as well you know that making it well. That's making it five across midfield. That could be an issue for us potentially, where we're outnumbered five v four. But then again, we have Tarimi who does like to drop in and, and yeah, try to help out defensively. Yeah. So we do we do still have players who can make it numerically. Uh, you know, fine for us. But again, it it, it has to happen for ninety minutes because if it so if we switch off at any point in the game. And numerically, we're down five v five v four. It can be a big difference in a, in a game against Japan. Five v four is 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 very easy for them to get through. So, I think it's a it's a good point. But um, again, it depends on the players' uh, work rate. How much are they going to track back and make it that numerical advantage for us, uh, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, again, you kind of nailed it on the head there. Uh, but in moments of the game. I, I felt like we did look more like a four-two-three-one, and so I, if Tarmi wants to come drop more into the midfield to support, you know, you have other players that can play that role as well. I think uh, Karim is more than comfortable playing in that deeper role as well. Um, so your wingers aren't just staying wide. You guys mentioned it. You know, if you're tucking in, you have more of a presence around the ball, and you're able to create uh, this kind of web anytime a midfielder gets it, and you're surrounding him from from the left side, from the attacking position, from the defensive position. And, and it's about that work rate, you know, are you willing to run more and, and suffer more defensively so that the other team doesn't have time on the ball? So that's, that's all it is. It's all the the mental, uh, mental side of it. I think, you know, looking at the players that we've got, you you can't really bench Osmond or Taremi. You know, you have to play them both. It's just the reality of the players that we've got. You know, maybe if in a, in a in an ideal situation, if Tarami was a natural winger, which uh, Kiros chose to play him as re- more regularly for national, chose to play as a left hand side winger, then yeah. But I think now Tarami has matured into a a more of a central player, whether that be a number ten, which I think he can play as, or 
as a number nine and you know someone playing off him. I still think that we need to play them both on the pitch. I do like that, you know, you could say midfield of Taremi with Oz with Kote Dusan. And as I told you, I think I think it does work. Should, will it work against Japan, South Korea? Which is the question that he's asking. It, we shall see. I think it's going to be a, a question that we all want to see answered. Uh, kind of with Carl and Louise reign this time around. We haven't seen us playing against a good team yet. So, so, so can I ask you who would you take off? Take off where? Well, if you're going to put uh, Osmond in, who are you going to take off? I think Ansari Fad. I think Ansari yeah. Fad would would come okay. off. Uh, not not right. that not that Ansari Fad should deserves to come off. I and mean, I think he, he did really well against Palestine. But I think I think when you want to go and you look at how many how how many goals Osman scored for his in his career, he just became the second top goal scorer in Iran's history. You know, Osman should play. Uh, I think Karim Ansari Fad. In his, you know, looking at looking at his this this season, he's only played I think eighty minutes of football. You know, again, he's playing in a Cypriot league. They're not a bad league. You know, he scored against Palestine, very good. I don't think Alan Sarifard had a great game against Palestine. He scored a good goal. I don't think he had a great a great game. So I don't think that means that all of a sudden Sardar gets benched and always Sardar did score a goal this game as well. So I think it's um it's a direct replacement there. I think I think Alan Sarifard does come off the bench for him, but. It's good that we've got Ansari Fard scoring goals, and when he when he's able to come mm. on, hopefully he'll impact the game off the bench. Yeah, as well. and he's a, he's a really good player to bring on in the last sort of fifteen twenty minutes, in my opinion. Um, when yeah. Osmond and, and Tarami are, you know, they have fairly high work rates, so when they get tired, I feel like he's a very good replacement because of both the leadership that he provides, as well as, I guess, the experience. Because you, you know, if we do do get a last minute penalty and Tarami's not on the pitch, he is. I, I I would put a lot of money on him converting that. That's a good um, point as against Portugal. Yeah, do you remember when when um before the twenty eighteen World Cup, Ansari Far played as a, as a midfielder for under Kairos. When he, when we played against Algeria in a friendly match, he played him as a number eight in midfield with Hai Safi and Ezatolai, and, and that was a, as a midfield three. And Ansari Far, in my opinion, has has always shown that he's got other qualities than. More strikers. He's got he's got he's got playmaking abilities. He can build up play, but I do think he's getting to a point in his career where he needs to now be a striker. I don't think he can really add that to his game in as much as he maybe used to be able to. Not not that he doesn't have it anymore. I think he still he still has it, but naturally with age, you you get to a point where you can't necessarily impact the game the way you want to. So I think the only guy who can really be a number nine for us. And guarantee us goals is Osmo at, at this moment in time. So I think you, you need you need to start him when it gets to the the later rounds of the, of the competition. Um, okay, last question from Twitter. We have a question here from um, uh, Ali Reza Halakul Nejad. He asks uh, about the injuries. Uh, Sardar and Chojo got injured. Uh, Khairiz Adeh's injury uh, is not as serious uh, from what I've heard. It's just a, a bit of a, a bit of a knock. He'll be okay for the next game. Uh, whether that means Majid starts, we shall see. Oh, so you got someone a Fallot as well who's available. Um, you know, uh, to to deputize. Uh, Sadar got a bit of a a scrape on his like calf area, ankle area. Uh, from the Palestinian player. It was a very rough game right, for the Palestine team, to must be said. They they were putting a couple of really hard tackles in, so um, Sardar was was left on the brunt of that one. But I think Sardar is okay as well. No issue with, with him um, for the game against Hong Kong. Yeah, I guess like as a recap, we're playing Hong Kong on Friday as the second game uh, in the Asian Cup. I would also say that I personally am going to the Asian Cup uh, on the 31st of January. So if anyone is listening and wants to hit me up, then yeah, very, very welcome to. Some of the Gold Bazan team are going to be there as well. Um, so yeah, and also before the Hong Kong game, we're doing a Twitter space as per usual before the game. Um, thank you so much for watching. Subscribe to us on YouTube, Instagram, everywhere. Uh, Arya, Stephen, thank you so much for joining me as a special guest. And I guess we'll see you guys in the next episode. Yeah, thanks a lot, Stephen. Appreciate your time. Uh, it's yeah. a great episode. Uh, always, always, always great seeing you guys. Thanks for having me on. Until next time. Cheers. Thanks, Stephen.
Hi, my name is Saman Godus. I'm playing for the Iranian national team and Brentford Football Club. And you are listening to Golbezan podcast.